to a series of webinars, Learn from Leaders, highlighting the principles for my upcoming book, Leading Global Diversity, Equity and Inclusion to be released in the fall of 2021. I'm Rohini Anand, the author. I thought that the best way to introduce some of the key concepts from my book is through conversation with the leaders that I actually quote in my book. By way of context, when I rewired from Sodexo in January of 2020, I decided to write a book on global diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm going to refer to diversity, equity, and inclusion as DEI from here on in. Um, I decided to write a book that was in my head. Why? because I wanted to share some of the lessons that I had learned in the hopes that they would be helpful to other change agents and leaders in avoiding the same missteps that I had made and in benefiting and they would benefit from the lessons that I had learned. You know, whenever I speak at conferences and events, global DEI draws the most interest and in speaking with the audience, the most frustration. I saw that while there may be lots of DEI books, what's missing is how to address DEI change in a global organizational context. There are several academic books on global DEI. This book is a view from the trenches, a view from someone who has had to pioneer a way forward without any real map. And this book is written for change agents in multinational organizations, including HR, DEI practitioners and leaders in for-profit and public sector organizations. It's also written for leaders in single country organizations as the principles that I articulate can be applied in a single country context as well. And in addition to my experience, I've talked with over 60 global leaders and folded their insights and stories into the principles in the book. And these are the leaders that I will be interviewing every month. Now, do any of these scenarios sound familiar to you? You're from Europe and you come to the US on a business trip and are surprised by how openly US Americans talk about personal experiences with race. You're uneasy about inviting any US facilitators to your country to talk about DEI in case they don't understand the sensitivities in discussing race. Or your women's employee resource group has been very successful in creating a sense of community and belonging for women. And you've tried to replicate that success in other countries, but in some places, women just don't seem to be interested. And at times, are even openly hostile to the idea. Or you give a presentation featuring the business case for DEI and you hear feedback that some people were offended that the company was trying to capitalize on diversity with no mention of it being the right thing to do. These are the kinds of head scratching situations that leaders and change agents in multinational organizations regularly encounter. It became clear to me that leaders around the world struggle to implement large scale change initiatives globally, not because of a lack of technical competence, but because of a lack of a nuanced understanding of the local context. My peers and other organizations are not always sure how to make the relevant across geographies. So why this book and what's it about? What this book offers is not a recipe but it offers principles that can empower change. The principles are derived from my work and experience from multiple companies and they work. The principles are simple, yet they're disruptive. What makes them powerful and useful is that they can be applied with sensitivity to any culture. The significance of a principles-based approach is that it empowers global leaders to develop their own solutions organically, rather than mimicking any one country's experience. So here are the five principles. The first principle is make it local. For global culture change to be effective and sustainable, it must be anchored in an understanding of local context informed by the history, the culture, the language, and the laws of each place. And with that understanding, change agents can push for change. Principle two is leaders change to lead change. 
transformative leadership is key to embedding DEI within an organization's culture. To lead with purpose and passion, leaders must disrupt their worldview and internalize the value of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The third principle is, and it's good for business too. Any successful and sustainable transformation effort requires a rationale for change. Absent a compelling change narrative, there is a high likelihood of it being unsuccessful. This rationale for change needs to be grounded in the local history as well as anchored in the organization's business strategy. Principle four is going deep, wide, and inside out. Organizations are comprised of interconnected systems that work in concert with each other. And as such, DEI needs to be infused into the processes, the policies, and structures throughout an organization, as well as in the external ecosystem where there are multiple stakeholders. And principle five is know what matters and count it. This principle considers the criticality of metrics and accountability. Metrics spotlight problem areas and their instruments for change, but they are most effective when they're aligned with the local context and managers are held accountable for achieving them. So as I said, it's important to note that these principles are not simply academic ideas or abstract untested strategies. They come from and through my own journey, my story, and the story of many pioneers of global DEI transformation. So I hope that you're gonna join me in the Learn From Leaders series, highlighting the principles from my upcoming book, Leading Global Diversity, Equity and Inclusion to be released in the fall of 2021. Thank you and see you soon, bye-bye. Welcome, Mark. I'm just absolutely delighted that you can join me today to discuss my upcoming book, Leading Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, that will be released in the fall. Um, I'm just honored to be in conversation with you. Um, for those that are listening in, Mark has extensive global DEI experience. Prior to his current role as Head of Global uh, Diversity, Inclusion, and Wellbeing at MNG. Did I get that title right, Mark? You did, yes. <laughs> Um, he was head of global diversity and inclusion at Barclays, a UK consumer and investment bank. And he's held some really impressive positions as director of diversity and inclusion at, at Booz Allen Hamilton in my neck of the woods, Washington, DC, as well as chief diversity officer at Whirlpool, which many of you know is a Fortune 500 company based in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Now, Mark, given that June is Gay Pride Month in the US and is celebrated in many parts of the world as well, not necessarily in June, but different times of the year, let's focus our conversation on sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. I, you know, Mark, I quote you extensively in my book, so I thought that would, it would be a great opportunity, a great way to discuss the principles that I lay out in my book through some examples that you share. So um, let's start with the first question. Um, you have some, you've had some amazing global roles. Can you share a little bit about your professional and personal journey and you know, what your journey was to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, so Rohini, actually I started my career in sales and marketing and I spent 20 years in both domestic and international roles. Mm -hmm. It was at Whirlpool Corporation at a time where diversity and inclusion was talked about as solely the war on talent. Mm -hmm. And it was great work we were doing in the brand portfolio group around market segmentation and understanding, right, the Whirlpool brand, the KitchenAid brand, the, uh, then the Amana brand. Mm -hmm. And I had, was in a meeting with Jeff Fettig, who was then the COO, and I said to Jeff, I don't question the business case around the war on talent, but why aren't we coupling that up with the business case for diversity and inclusion? And Jeff said, I don't know, help me do that. Why don't we do that? And that really started me on this journey of understanding that as the head of DNI, if you position it well, you should really be positioned between HR and the business. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Helping to be that bridge. And shortly thereafter, you have to watch the questions you're, you asked because then I became the director of diversity and uh -huh. ultimately the chief diversity officer at Whirlpool. And I haven't looked back because I've enjoyed this work and really understanding the answer to the question of, you know, does it make business sense or are we doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. And we're doing both, but you have to be purposeful in achieving both and linking both up if you want to be able to answer sort of that, that question that we're always asked. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. So going to, um, and I think, you know, you've obviously done it right in terms of the positioning of diversity, equity, inclusion within the business strategy and the brand, which I think is always what makes it successful and sustainable, right? Yeah. Um, and I think you're right. It's about doing both. It's not an either or. It's about benefiting the business, doing the right thing for social justice. So I think if you do it right, you can achieve both, which is awesome. And we'll explore that a little bit more. So I guess one of the questions that I'd like to ask you is the first principle in my book is what I call make it local. And make it local is about understanding the local context, but pushing for change using local change agents, right? And the examples that you shared that I actually quote in the book are just fantastic. I was so impressed with how you did that where in countries that were not gay friendly, like Singapore and Uganda, you were able to really push for change, but in a very thoughtful, intentional way. Kenji Yoshino of NYU Law School actually describes this as the advocate model, where he talks about sort of seeking to influence society and laws, and that takes a lot of courage and intentionality and a lot of skill to do it right. So can you share those examples in terms of what you did and how you did it, particularly in countries that are not gay friendly? Because I think, you know, people listening in can really learn from those examples. Sometimes you think, well, make it local means kind of accepting whatever exists, but I think you were able to walk that fine line, so. Yeah, Rohini, and, and you know, it's, it's an interesting balance, right, of having a, a global strategy and then understanding that the applicability, the, what's the right word, the, not the impact, right? But the level of applicability is going to be very different in each country because culturally, as you're saying, we're in different places. Mm -hmm. uh, a good example with Singapore was when the, we, it, at, when I was at Barclays, we were very much a part of Pink Dot, right. which is Singapore pride for those who aren't familiar with Pink Dot. Um, the government decided to change the law about utilization of Poets Corner, where Pink Dot held pride, Singapore Pride every year, and basically rewrote it because the property is government owned, mm -hmm. that multinationals would have to put in for a permit. And they could not um, sponsor events that weren't government sanctioned events in um poet's corner which in essence sort of tied pink dot's hands because pink dot was predominantly at that time sponsored by multinational organizations mm -hmm. uh, in, in support of pride and you have to follow the rule of uh, of the land right so we said that's fine we still support pink dot and everything that pink dot does we won't be able to sponsor uh pink dot as an event but we will continue to celebrate Pride Month with our colleagues in our own locations and continue to recognize that support of our colleagues and our clients, our customers. As that conversation happened and it happened publicly, mm -hmm. right? It right. showed that we were aligned with the Singaporean government following the rule of law, but yet within our own locations, what we stood for remained solid. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the upside to that story is by showing visible support for our LGBT colleagues and support for the community more generally, the Singaporean businesses who had not been a part of Pink Dot in the past actually picked up where the multinationals had been blocked. Right. Right. Came in and it was no longer raising 250000 
Singaporean dollars. I think they surpassed that in the first year. So you never know what a catalyst for change can be, mm -hmm. right? What looks like a barrier in this case actually pushed the agenda to be more local in a very positive way, right? The support from the community was there, mm -hmm. but it wasn't necessarily visible because the multinationals had been visible. Right. right. So this was really a transference of ownership in a positive way right. by organizations like EY and Barclays and HSBC not stepping back, but stepping aside mm -hmm. and continuing our support in the ways we could, showing the community we weren't going away, but then the community and the local businesses picked it up. What, and, just, yeah. Mark, I think what's so impressive here is that you played, it was a key role that you played because you came in. So there was sort of some cross border, if you will, infusion of ideas, pushing gently for change, but then at the right moment, stepping aside to allow the local change agents to take over. But without that infusion of cross border kind of experience, knowledge, ideas, it may not have happened, but I think it's, it's just, very well balanced. Go ahead. I was going to say, and that's really the the baseline for a positive strategy, right? right? It's not who starts the work. It's really understanding where is that transference of ownership, where it becomes sustainable, whether we're talking about a business, a business unit, or within country, right? I think that shows the model, knowing when mm -hmm. to step aside, not step away. There's right. a big difference between the two, the support, right? The support was still there. And that's what you were talking about with the advocate model. Remaining an advocate where you can, remaining visible, continues to help the work move forward. But sometimes you have to let it go, right? right to let it expand, quite honestly. Yeah. Uh, the work I was involved in Uganda was uh, a bit trickier. Mm -hmm. I will say it was much more emotionally charged. Uh, there was at the time legislation that had been had written into it uh, a death penalty for LGBT, and it was very specific to being caught in the act of having homosexual sex. Right. But the point was, it was a death sentence. Mm -hmm. And myself and uh, an old friend of yours and mine, Ana Duarte McCarthy, uh, were called out on a... Um, internet um, signature to say, you know, sign this petition, Mark McLean, Anna Duarte McCarthy, what are you going to do about this? Mm -hmm. um, and I look at Barclays, we said, we've got to support our colleagues in Uganda. We also realized as with any country, right? Doing the work in country being supported from the home office is the right approach. No country wants anyone to say, look, this is how we do it in New York or London, and this is the way you should do it. But the support and the infrastructure has to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, we monitored the situation in Uganda. We had people on the ground in London supporting our government relations and our communications folks in Uganda. We asked our employee resource group to not make their opinions known, but to continue to fill uh, fill in the blanks for me and the team around information they've heard or if they'd seen something on social media that I might not be aware of. So they were an active part of gathering information. And with Barclays, we just let it be known at that time that we didn't support the position of the government or the law. And then through government relations, through the right communications channels, really helped the law to be moved along, if you will, right? And it mm -hmm. went through a few stages. It was rewritten a few times. Uh, one of my counsel to colleagues was, it's not law until it's signed off, right? And fortunately, the law was never signed off in the, in the way it was written originally around a death sentence for, in, as it related to homosexuality. Right. It, it was still an unpalatable law. There was still prison time, but we had moved it along. And I, I really think there is a case for using your brand, using your business and your influence 
in country, right, to help move it along. Now, those are two pretty big examples. And individuals listening might say, well, yeah, we're not in either of those countries. There's a lot of countries today, though, where legally we could even collect data on LGBT. But right. because it's not socially accepted, we tend not to. Right. I don't take that position. Right. right. Yeah, I think this is, both of them are just incredibly impressive examples, Mark. And I think it takes so much skill. And I know that colleagues of mine, um, you know, kind of shy away from these situations. But it takes a lot of dexterity because you're doing two things. One is you're saying, I accept the situation. Um, but I also notice as a change agent, my role is to really push you know, towards uh, social justice. And that's what my role is and that's what I'm gonna do. It takes influencing leaders, but it also takes this sort of very nuanced approach where you're not coming in as a Western imperialist, <laughs> saying, I know the right solutions for you, right? Which is what you did in Singapore. You know, just very, very sort of, you know, carefully kind of orchestrated the situation. But I guess a follow on question to that, Mark, is how did you influence your leaders to take that position? I guess part of it was that the employees, and I'm talking about Uganda in particular, the employees were, you know, I mean, they're the ones who were demanding it. So what did you use to kind of influence leaders? Because this could have been a situation where they could have lost business, right? So I guess, how did yes, you relate so that? At, at the time I had a uh, CEO who truly understood the diversity inclusion strategy. Great. I think this is part of, look, as an organization, you have to be honest and say, are we going to take a strategic approach or are we going to take a programming approach? Right. I won't work for an organization that's taking a programming approach. Not that I don't think it works, it does. It just has a diminishing point of returns yep. very early on. So taking a strategic approach, having LGBT plus built into that, then you have the positioning to go back and say, but our position is, right? okay? And that isn't just in the good times, it's in the more difficult times. How as a brand are we going to show up? Are we going to waver or are we going to stay true to our values regardless of right, what we're being faced with? And I think if you do it in that way, yeah. that gives senior leaders the confidence to say, we have this foundation. These are our values. And our first priority was to make certain our colleagues in country were safe. Right. Okay. Yeah. And you can't waver if you're a values driven organization in what sounds to be the simplest thing you can do, which is also the most important and most impactful, that talks a lot about your brand, okay? Mm -hmm. I also at one time in another country where someone had warned me very politely, right? About talking about being LGBT and I thought, well, there's a problem because I am. That's the first <laughs> point, <laughs> okay? Um, the CEO said to me, he said, Mark, people are going to have to decide whether they do business with us or not Yeah, based, that... on, based on their values. He said, we're not going to have, everyone's not going to want to do business with us. Right. Okay. And uh, actually, uh, I've had two CEOs, um, now three, say that to me. And that says a lot of the character of the organization, the brand, and what they're saying about values, behaviors, diversity, inclusion aren't all separate things. Well, you've raised two really important things before we move on to the, to the next question. I think one is this is not sort of a finite point in time. You have to work at this for the long haul. And if you do it right, when a situation like this comes up, then you're well positioned because you've already worked with your CEO, you've influenced them, they've been on their journey. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I remember at Sodexo, it was the same thing when I was there, there was a situation where one of the clients said, you know, we want you to take out off the website all the information about um, your pride ERG, employee resource group. And the CEO said, no, I mean, you know, we're not going to, this is who we are and it's a slippery slope. What next? You know, we want information about women. We don't, I mean, <laughs> where are we going to go with this? It's about value. Because to your point, Rahini, you could pick a point somewhere in the world 
where at some point, some part of our work is going to come up against barriers, whether it's education, uh, limiting women's education Absolutely. through to transgender rights. Absolutely right. And I think the other piece that I think is so impressive in the Uganda example is that it's not that you took the approach of we're not going to do business. You know, it was a very carefully calibrated intentional approach where let's try and influence the situation because at the end of the day, that's what advocacy is about. So kudos to you and Barclays for doing what you did. It was very, very, and I really, really hope that folks will you know, listen to this because this is such a hot topic. And I think people can really learn from it. Leaders, DEI practitioners, HR professionals. So thank you for sharing that. The third principle in my book, and again, you, you cite some really impressive examples. The third principle of the book is called, and it's good for business too. And, you know, we, as you said before, it's not neither or, it's about doing the right thing. It's about moving towards social justice, but also making it good for the business. And you have an interesting story about in this chapter about how you went about making Barclays the most inclusive bank in the UK for the LGBTQ community. So just share, you know, what that was, your successes, your challenges, and what impact it had on employees. Yeah, I, I, I'm smiling when you said I had, a, I helped make Barclays the most inclusive bank. Actually, Barclays did it. I just happened have I got to play the role of catalyst to really again help us move our strategy along. Mm -hmm. So uh, Pride in London, as it's uh, today called, uh, the group who put uh, who took over uh, London Pride and became Pride in London came to me with their proposal and business case. Mm -hmm. I looked at it and I said uh, to uh, Michael Salter who was the person who came and pitched me. I said, Michael, without the PowerPoint presentations, what is it you want to do? What is it you're trying to do? He said, Mark, I, I want Pride in London to be revenue generating for the city of London, to be the beacon of why we as individuals are important in this community, mm -hmm. that we are viable members of the community in the UK. And I said, okay because that's what we want as a bank. We want our customers to know they're welcome and our colleagues to know. So as that transpired, we became the um, headline sponsors for Pride in London and we had a choice. We could go as an employer of choice because of the work we were doing, ranking you know, in the top 10 of Stonewall and uh, the uh, HRC in the United States having 100% as Barclays, but I took the, the opportunity to go to the business, both the Barclay card business and the Barclays UK retail bank. Mm -hmm. And said, so, do we wanna go as a, as a employer of choice or the bank of choice? Now, when you ask a question like that, you've gotta be ready to answer the question, right? right? Because it, the question was, well, what does that look like, Mark? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, at that time, Barclay card and Barclays were really into wearable banking. It was the, prior to you know, all the pay apps. And I said, what if we take that rubber band? That's what it looked like. It looked like a, a Livestrong band mm -hmm. that we use for British summertime in Hyde Park that has a chip in it and make Pride contact us. Awesome. And the question, yeah, and the question was, well, how many people go to Pride in London? I said, well, Trafalgar Square has about 100,000. That's right. <laughs> now, we did exactly that. We launched a product called BPEG with pride and we used our banking app at the time ping it to take donations for pride in london and you could donate and send your picture and your picture would come up on the jumbotron screen in, 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 in trafalgar square and it just we showed up as a business in support of the community awesome. and the intent there was to say look we not only want you to work with us you, you want us to, we want you to bank with us and and the mo the the thing I was most proud of in the many years that I was part of Barclays being the headline sponsor was a very good colleague, a good friend and colleague of mine who happened to be a transgender woman. Mm -hmm. Our colleagues showed up as pride heroes. They were part of the advertising every year. And we used our, our um, ATMs throughout the whole of the UK 
Mm -hmm. um, but Amy uh, was one of our pride heroes. And she said she was standing at a bank of ATMs down in uh, Piccadilly Circus, which for others listening is like Times Square in New York. And there's five or six ATMs and she's there with a friend of hers and this gentleman looks and he doesn't do his transaction. He looks at the advertisement and he looks at Amy and he looks at the advertisement. And she said, and he looked back and she said, dread filled me, Mark, because I knew my picture was on that ATM. Mm -hmm. And she said, he just mouthed very quietly, is this you? And she said, it is. And he went. <laughs> That's awesome. That's and so she, cool. She, right, she held that story. And you, it, it's in those moments, you know, you're having a positive impact by stepping forward, right? Helping recognize the broader community as our colleagues who are, take, who are taking care of you every day, right? Yeah. When you come to our business and a viable part of the community. And I, that sticks with me today because she went from having fear in that moment right, right to being proud, which yeah. she should be, for stepping up and being visible yeah. in, in, in such a way that not everyone has to. So right. I think that shows how being an, an inclusive brand is really all encompassing, right? Is your colleagues, your, your employees are willing to stand up and be the face of the brand, then you have no question, do you have the right to be there? They've mm -hmm. answered that question for you. That's awesome. That's really terrific. And I think the two things that sort of stand out for me when we're in the story that you shared. One is just how with such dexterity you really embedded LGBTQ plus into the business model to benefit the business, which is great. In doing so, you're impacting positively the employees. And I think your CEO, if I'm not mistaken, actually there's a quote in the book where he said that, you know, that employees feel proud about working for Barclays. And that story perfectly illustrates that. But I think the other piece that we can't lose sight of as well, Mark, is that it takes tremendous amount of courage for people to share their stories and to come out, those that have had these lived experiences in the workplace. And, you know, this Amy story, you know, there was fear, right? Yeah. There was fear. It's, it took her a lot of courage to come out and, and share who she was. And I think we just can't minimize that. No, no, you yeah. can't. Yeah. Rahini, you can't. And, and the thing about being part of the LGBT plus community is every time you have the conversation, you're coming out. That's right? true. Yeah. Because you have to gauge your audience. And That's in right. Amy's case, she really was conscious about being safe. Yeah. Right? But there she was on ATMs across, uh, across the Capitol, right? And, and that shows the courage. And then she has to know, I have to know as an organization, talking about being gay, that I am supported, right? right. Not that, and, and in that support, then I'm supporting the business. It has to be two ways. It can't be one or the other. That's right. You know, sometimes we forget, Mark, because so often we draw on stories of people who've had lived experiences, which is wonderful. But I do think that we have to be careful how we, you know, when and how we do that because of the toll it takes on the individual. And I think leaders also need to take responsibility for their own learning right? Because it's not just about having those who've had these experiences share their experiences, but it's leaders taking ownership of their own learning journey. So a great story. And, uh, you know, I know that you have a lot of these examples that you shared in the book, and no wonder I quoted you extensively. <laughs> I think people listening in will realize why, because there's just so much, you know, I could keep, you know on and on in this. Um, so let's just shift gear for a moment. And this is a you know a bit of a tricky question, but I think there's no one better to answer this question than you, because I, I really consider you as a thought leader in the space, incredible experience. So I've often been asked about the acronym LGBTQ+, right? Each letter of the acronym really re represents a distinct group. You know, while gay, bisexual, lesbian, 
um, the focus is more on sexual orientation. Yeah. Trans is more focused on gender expression, gender identity. So I guess I've been asked very often, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on grouping these subgroups together, each having a very distinct experience, a very distinct journey, right? So do you think that grouping them together actually creates a more positive impact um, with more sort of voices pushing for change? Or does it possibly marginalize some of the more unique experiences in, in, in doing this? So just, just thoughts. Yeah, and, and I, I don't wanna sound contrite, but I really believe that there's power in numbers, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's not that LGBTQ plus stands for a community. It stands for an amalgamation of individuals who have been underrepresented regardless of their sexual orientation, right? And I think that falls into the transgender community. It's not about sexual orientation as much as being marginalized. Right. So understanding that that marginalization with it comes came fear and violence at times across that entire spectrum of those letters. Mm -hmm. I also think it shows a an understanding within the community that look, being a gay man, a white gay man of 58, my experience is very different than my friends and colleagues who are black gay men at this age. Right. And it's also very different than a 20 year old white gay male today. Right. Okay? So if you wanted to even break down the gay community, look at the difference across generation today. So for me, it's about coming together as a community of support understanding just like with any diversity strategy, we were talking about different countries, okay? even different populations within countries are at different uh, starting points as it relates to human rights. Mm -hmm. But showing that support of our transgender colleagues, I think is bringing us together as a community shows the greater support. It takes work to do that, right? Because there is so much difference. And across the community, I think it's more about staying together, supporting each other, is a different form of allyship. Right. I, I believe I have a responsibility to be an ally within the LGBT community because I have had allyship, particularly from straight women. Right? And I've said this many times, I wouldn't be where I am today if straight women did not step up and say enough mm -hmm. to straight men, okay? That moved gay white men into a different role. Mm -hmm. I think at, at all points of my life, but particularly now, I have that same, same responsibility to be that ally for others, right? To use my power and influence in a really positive way within the, not just the LGBT community, but more broadly in my role, but personally within the LGBT uh, plus community to help continue to gain understanding. What does it mean to be queer, right? Because when I grew up being queer was derogatory. Right. I identify as gay. Uh, what does it mean to be someone who identifies as transgender? What are the barriers? How do we get healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. I have that level of influence to help move that agenda along. That's where I think keeping the community together shows a greater strength of force for, for positive change than being separate. Great, yeah, no, I think at the end of the day, I guess, you know, allyship is important and this is a clear demonstration of allyship in terms of, you know, the collective and also recognizing that in any of these identities there are intersectionalities, right? I mean, we all, yeah are more than just one single identity. Um, which, and that applies yeah. within the LGBTQ plus community as well. So, you know, yeah. recognizing the intersectionality, but the collective power of allyship, I think that's awesome. Thank you, that's wonderful. So I think, you know, for those that ask this question, I think you have a very clear answer and uh, really appreciate the clarity around that. So going back to sort of, you know, global transformation, what makes DEI transformation successful globally, especially as it relates to uh, LGBTQ inclusion? And you know, in in the book, 
uh, as I mentioned, I talk about five principles, right? Make it local. Um, I talk about leaders change to lead change, the importance of, of leadership commitment, but the fact that they have to disrupt their own worldviews and internalize the value of diversity. I talk about, and it's good for business too, so you have to have a compelling rationale for change, um, whatever that is, social justice, business case, legal requirements, whatever that might be. Um, and it's not either or, it can be all of the above. Yeah. I also talk about going deep, wide, and inside out. And by that, I mean sort of scaling wide through governance structures and strategy and metrics, going deep through local champions and, um, and wide um, it through and really embedding it within all of your processes. Um, sorry, inside out, embedding it in all of your processes. And the last one is the metrics and, uh, and accountability. So know what matters and count it. So, you know, in my mind, it's these principles that really are um, very important in um, embedding DEI and making it sustainable. So um, as it relates to LGBTQ inclusion, can you just share, you know, what makes DEI transformation successful globally? So I think it's every element, Rohini, that you just talked about. But I think the starting point is, first of all, having a strategy that is, that includes LGBT. Right, so every right. strategy I've ever built is built on gender, ethnicity, nationality, LGBT plus disability, and what I now term as life stages instead of generations. I think the, the most important thing is really building it into the infrastructure of the organization. Right. And I, I start with our HR systems, because mm -hmm. if we're going to have LGBT plus as part of the strategy, we also have to have data supporting it. Right. So mapping out where you legally can allow for self-identification and then baking that into your HR system really starts the local conversation, right? right? So in countries, uh, let me pick one such as Poland, right? Where socially today, right? Companies may not be at a, at a place where they think self-identification is going to be accepted. The reality is it's legal. Mm -hmm. Right. And Look, I, I think all the way back when I was working with Booz Allen Hamilton in Washington, D.C., someone said, but Mark, you know, we know it's legal, but should we be? I said, look, as a gay man, whether I check the box or not isn't as important as having the box there. Right. So my first impression of does this strategy really hold water is when I come into the organization and I start filling out the forms or now online, I can self-identify. Right. And I think that's where you start to build the strong foundation, Rahini, for change. And then you build up from there, right? What does right. that mean in each country and how that's the first nudge, okay, right. yeah. for a step forward. And that's no small nudge mm -hmm. in, in, in some cultures, right. but it is the starting point. I think that's where you start to build on success. Right. And it also helps, I think, the organization to feel supported that this is real. Mm -hmm. It's built into our infrastructure. Yeah, and I think you know it's, it's a validation. It provides space for dialogue, for conversation. Yeah. So all of the above, awesome, that's great. Right. Um, so I think you know, in terms of just some closing questions, right? What, you know, which, what accomplishment are you proudest of? You've done so many things. What are you proudest of? And any advice that you might have for those leading LGBTQ uh, plus inclusion around the world? So what are you proudest of when it comes to LGBTQ plus inclusion? I know you've shared some great examples and I'm sure that's uh, but anything else you'd like to share and then any, yeah. any the advice. Thing, I, thing I'm proudest of was when I was working at Whirlpool a couple of um, now good friends in the community came to me and they said, we want to have a gay pride or a gr gay film festival. Mm -hmm. I said in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Yes. So to what end? And really what they wanted to do was raise money to start a helpline because between Chicago and Saugatuck in Southwest Michigan, there was no LGBT resource center or helpline. And I said, wow, 
that's amazing. Yeah. And we started this uh, gay film festival, right? With a uh, silent auction and a little bit of wine. <laughs> I invited every executive from Whirlpool. That's great. Right? I, every year I would send them a few tickets and ask if they wanted more, not ask if they wanted tickets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I'm most proud of is that from that gay film festival, there now stands the Out Center in Benton Harbor, Michigan, which is an LGBT community resource center. That's fantastic. And, and just taking that idea from a film festival to an online resource to it now being a community center run by amazing individuals and a board of directors. And this goes back to me saying earlier, you have to know when to step aside. Mm -hmm. anyway, I was on the board for many years and then I was offered to start work with the Boys and Girls Club in Benton Harbor. And I said, yeah, but I have to step aside. And people said, no, I said, yeah, no, it has to go to the next level. But knowing I was part of establishing the Out Center. Yeah, that's what I'm most proud of. Fantastic. What a, what a shift, what a change and what a lasting impact legacy. That's fantastic. I know there are many stories there, but this one is, is particularly powerful. So thank you for sharing. Um, just any advice that you might have for individuals that are leading LGBTQ plus inclusion around the world? Yeah, I, I would say balance your passion mm. right, with expectations, but don't give up. Okay. Fantastic. This is hard work. Yeah, fantastic. But don't give up. Yeah, yeah. I think you've shared just so many incredible stories today and in the book about how you actually practice that. You know, you came across all these stumbling blocks in different parts of the world, but how you kind of used individual strategies to navigate the local situations and came up with ways to kind of, you know, change and have a positive impact. So. Thank you very much, Mark. This was absolutely fantastic. As always, I continue to learn from you, which is why I quote you so extensively in the book. And for those listening, the book is going to be out um, in the fall of this year, 2021. It's called Leading Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And it's a book based on the five principles that I mentioned. And the next time, next month, we're going to be, uh, I will have be interviewing Kristen Anderson from Barilla, who's going to talk about uh, how she implemented the strategy of making it local. So thank you again, Mark, and have a wonderful rest of your week. Take thank care. you. Thank you for having me. Thank you and, and take care.